السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه Brothers and sisters, welcome to another live edition of your program Ask Huda Our phone numbers beginning with the area code are 0020-1250-08679 Alternatively area code 0020-1200 4246-4583 and the Facebook page is DR Muhammad Salah official email address is ask at huda.tv I believe we already have a caller waiting on the line Assalamu alaikum Brother Hamid Salam. from the KSA Assalamu alaikum welcome to ask huda Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh welcome to ask huda brother uh, Hamid how are you sir? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. First of all, I request you to pray for my deceased parents, please. May Allah bless you and your parents. May Allah have mercy on them. Make their graves, gardens of paradise. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khair. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Yeah? My wife wants to give some money as Sadaqa Jari. Okay. Can she give it for Sadaqa Jari she wants to give? Some money. Can she give it for the construction of a mosque? Okay. This is the first question. Okay. The second question is, one of my 27 years old relatives, who is a very God-fearing girl, saw a dream and requested me to ask you the meaning of that dream. She says that I saw uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad uh, in my dream. Uh, I just saw his shadow talking to me. I felt as if he was uh, angry with me. He asked me while pointing his fingers towards me if I doubt him. And I answered that I have no doubts. I said, no one can doubt you. Then he said, he will show me. And I felt it was a warning. After a few days, I fell ill and I thought I have made something wrong. That's why Prophet Muhammad was angry with me. All this happened when I had gone for Hajj. I failed to understand what mistake had I made. Whenever I remember this dream, many questions start arising in my mind. I want to know what actually this dream means. Jazakallah khair. Oh, oh, jazakum, brother Hamid. Barakallah feek. Jazakallah khairan. Sister Maggie from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh Muhammad Salah, I would prefer to welcome back to Egypt and for the TV. Thank you. Barakallah feek. May Allah bless you your family. We hope you enjoyed your time abroad, and inshallah, next time we look forward to seeing you in that sheikh competition. Oh, <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Um, I have a question regarding um, how uh, we're supposed to be replying to those people who greet us during holidays and celebrations that are innovations and not part of their religion. Yeah. Uh, for example, birthdays, uh, the only answer I can give them is a thank you. So I don't know how to reply back. Uh, would that think you'll be okay, or should we totally ignore their their greeting? Okay, thank you, uh, thank Sister Mami. Barakallah feek. We appreciate uh, your participation. May Allah bless you and your family. I just want to tell Brother Hamid in the in the beginning that um, uh, I do not interpret dreams, and I mentioned that repeatedly. Even on a small scale, I try to avoid two things: interpreting dreams and exorcism, because once you open this door. Uh, it's hard to do anything else. You'll just uh, convert the show into dream interpretation. And, uh, you know, wherever you go, people will ask you to uh, do exorcism and the jinn and all of that. So um, uh, I would limit the program only to answer fiqh questions, insha'Allah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Sister Maggie from Egypt, with regards to whenever uh, people participate in non-Islamic uh, holidays, celebrations, and festivals. How to um, answer them whenever they ask you, why don't you celebrate them, or they ask you to participate and you abstain. 
you just simply say thank you what should you say well uh, it depends on the type of the audience the person who is inviting you because sometimes uh, it's either a person who's naive and does not understand in this circumstances I would take advantage to explain to them because guess what wallahi there are people who know very little about their deen and subhanallah once you share with them the fact that you know you're not supposed to do that or you're supposed to do this they say I didn't know that before and this happened since the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam started his da'wah until today and it will continue to happen until the day of judgment so we should not assume that all the audience are the same or they should be educated this is number one uh, you understand that the story of the man who passed urine in the masjid and when the Sahaba were really angry with him and the Prophet sallallahu asked them to uh, calm down then he approached them and he said you know you're not supposed to do it in the masjid what did he say he said I swear to Allah I didn't know that I thought you can always do it whenever you want to so to that extent there are a lot of people who are born and raised um, you know living with family traditions cultural traditions assuming that this is a deen I did mention before about a colleague an amidi a doctor in the States every time we pray jama'ah I see him praying the sunnah sitting down so I assume that he has some rheumatoid and once I made dua for him and I said may Allah give you shifa he said why, why do you think I'm sick I said because you always pray sunnah while sitting down he said because we have to my grandma taught me that you cannot pray the sunnah while standing to that extent so uh, I will continue inshallah answer your question after this call assalamu alaikum Sister Juwaria from Uganda. Salam alaikum, Sister Juwaria. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Thank you for the program. May Allah reward you, Sheikh. And you too. Thank you so much. Now I was asking, Sheikh, is taking a fashion and designing course haram? When you take a course, I learn how to make short skirts. I learn how to make many dresses and trousers. When I sell them and women wear them outside, house or in public am I sharing the scene so is it haram to take that course the course of, of what exactly what is the course all about yani the course is about learning how to make dresses like a, a buyer like a, any shirt like anything you can you can make and when I like if I make like a, a short dress and the woman buys it I don't know if she's going to sell to wear it in the house for her husband. I don't know if she's going to wear it in public. Mm. So if she wears that in public, am I sharing the scene? Or? Okay, okay. I got your question, Sister Juwaria. Okay, sure. Sister Sarah from uh, Qatar. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, brother, I have uh, two questions. Mm hmm and uh, first, I want to know, is it permissible, like, for example, for a husband or a wife, when they go out to a public, like, a uh, bank or any place uh, to deal with a person and the other person is the opposite sex? And besides uh, att attending to the matter, besides attending to the matter, uh, is it permissible, like, for both of them, the husband or and the other person or the wife and the other person to start talking about the personal for example where do you work what do you do and all this uh, start a personal conver conversation okay okay who's having the and personal and there will be some giggling smiling sister sir who's and having the the yes. personal conversation the wife of this brother uh, and okay. the wife of the for other example, person a husband, a husband or a wife go okay. out in public Okay. So, some places, mm -hmm. and the person that they're dealing is the opposite sex. Okay, I see. Okay, and 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 in that matter of it, uh, after finished, uh, I mean, the moment while doing the issue, the matter in the bank, for example, and both of them are having some private conversation. Means nothing got to do with the work. It's something about personal. So, is it permissible? Okay. Okay, I got a question. Okay. And and okay and another uh, another uh, question is for example if the husband start uh, giving the abusive langu language towards the wife and the wife replied back 
but not abusive, but the truth of the person, uh, of the husband, and the husband beat the wife. Does mm. she have right to her self-defense? Does she have right to do what? To beat him back? Self-defense. He, he, for example, he hit her on the face. Mm. So can she have that self-defense? And oh. there are uh, two of my questions, brother. Please help me. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Sister Sarah from Qatar. You seem to have a serious problem. May Allah make it easy for you. Okay, back, um, uh, back to answering Sister Maggie's question from Egypt. Um, replying to a person who is inviting you to celebrate whatever a non Islamic celebration. So he said, we distinguish between two main categories a person who does not know, Muslims, but do not know. So I'm due to explain to them, and I give a few examples, that really people do not know, born and raised in this uh, you know, cultural practices, and they assume that this is the norms. So it is my duty to explain to them. There are other people who already know what is right and what is wrong, but they're very argumentative, very argumentative. How I deal with such people, I just say simply because I love the Prophet ﷺ and I love to follow him. I would only do what he did, and I would not do anything that he did not do. And I believe, no doubt, that the greatest man ever was Prophet Muhammad And his lifestyle was all guidance to his believers, to his followers. And this is what Allah said in Surah Al-Najm, So had it been a good thing, he would have done it. And if it was not, then the Prophet was more worthy than anybody else to abstain from it. If people need further more proof, we can provide them with proofs, such as when the Prophet objected to some of the companions when they joined others in celebrating their festivals. And he said, Allah has indeed given us two better Eids. And these are the only two Eids that we celebrate, Eid al-Fitri and Eid al-Adha. Coming from this part of the world, we've seen, you know, <laughs> vast majority of Muslims are celebrating even non-Muslim uh, holidays, and they simply don't understand the history behind it, and why they are doing that. They say it's, it's an opportunity to have fun and, you know, eat particular food or go out and so on. This is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ forbade. He forbade joining the non-believers in their festivals, in their religious festivals. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you for asking this question. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Yusra from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, I just want to ask you, I have two American non-Muslim half-brothers, and I haven't seen one of them for like 10 years, and I haven't met my niece or nephew until now because of the Nahran issue. Yeah. And actually, not all my family there are non Muslim, and I wanted to go there to visit them and have some family time and also give them a good impression about Islam. Yeah. So I wanted to know if it is permissible to travel for like a uh, visit for a one month visit with my sister. I may go with my uncle, but I will surely come alone, come back alone. So is, is that permissible to, to come back without a mahram in this situation? Sister Yusra, uh, I actually got your question and it's in the list that it should be answered today. The question I received on the Facebook, that's why I remember uh, the story. Uh, whenever we present uh, an answer supported with a proof, as you all know that, especially with regards to women traveling the travel distance alone without uh, a mahram, we say that the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and the vast majority of the Muslim Jews are of the view that uh, based on the sound, a hadith, it's not only one hadith, several a hadith, the Prophet وسلم, emphasized the fact that it is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and in the last day to travel alone without uh, a mahram with her. Uh, once three days, once less than that, once the travel distance, any journey. You said that you're traveling for uh, a mission, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you and uh, reward you for your good intention. So according to the vast majority of the Jews, and according to the sound references narrated by the Prophet wasallam, that it is not permissible unless if it is necessary. 
necessity is something that you really, it's a matter of, you know, life or death. You have to do it and you don't have any alternative. You're neither married or your husband cannot travel with you. You don't have um, uh, brothers or uncles or, you know, in mahram to travel with you and you have to. Let me give you an example. Many sisters who um, join their husbands uh, as expats working in the Gulf or here or there and subhanallah maybe the husband will expire will fall sick they cannot uh, and, and they stay behind and now the wife has to go home uh, you know she doesn't have anyone to take her of course she may travel alone you know that's a necessity uh, so each person should look into their condition based on that if you say that there are some scholars who say it is permissible I agree and that's why I say the vast majority of the Muslim jurists of the earlier and the later, and in the light of the sound hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that it is not permissible unless if it is something necessary. May Allah bless you, Sister Yusra, for your good intention, and may Allah guide your entire family to Islam. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Muhammad from Chad. Muhammad, Assalamu alaikum. No problem. Okay. Sister Aisha from Nigeria is next on the line. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Aisha. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I I want to know um, uh, what what can someone do with a husband who is uh, drinking and sometimes he misses prayer. Mm -hmm. His prayers. Bye. What? Yes. Let's go. Thank you. You're most welcome, Sister Aisha. Sister Juaria from Uganda. MashaAllah, she attends courses, tailing and doing dresses. Um, what if she makes these dresses? Uh, you know, supposedly she's selling them to women to be worn at home. But what if she wears them outside and she goes out with them? wearing these revealing clothes. It's not your problem. You're not blameworthy, especially if you're selling them to a Muslim woman. If these um, uh, you know, outfit that you're making are supposed to be worn at home, then they go out with them. It is not your problem. But of course, if you know that you're selling this in a society where people actually wear this outside and you design or they are designed for this purpose, I'm not supposed to help them to reveal their aura. Sister uh, Sarah from uh, Qatar, um, the question reflects that you're having a serious problem, not necessarily you, whoever that you're talking about him. That when a, a husband and wife go out and they talk to the opposite uh, sexes, that the husband speaks to somebody else's wife and uh, lets his wife speak to somebody else's husband, and they have an unnecessary conversation, is that permissible? Of course it is not permissible. What breaks the barriers of chastity and modesty is basically uh, you know, beginning a conversation, an unnecessary conversation, and getting used to the person. This person is not your husband, he's not one of your maharim, and you, 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 guess what, you're talking to him in front of your husband, and he's talking to the other person's uh, wife. This is very liberal. Yes, indeed. Uh, what is the purpose of this conversation? You know, if, if somebody, uh, we're inviting somebody, or somebody is inviting us, and they say, Salaam alaikum, sister, how are you? How's your family? How's everything? You know, uh, in a very moderate way, fine, no problem. Somebody is not feeling well, he inquires about him and about his situation, fine, in, in, the, in the proper context. But as you mentioned, dragging the conversation to unnecessary talk, talk about private matters, personal matters, that is not permissible, of course. And, uh, you know, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the great companions of the Prophet وسلم, said that if anyone would dare to speak to my wife, I would chop off his head. So the companions complained to the Prophet وسلم, that uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf is very jealous and he's saying, so he said, are you amazed? Allah is more jealous than him. Okay? So one should really protect 
is the chastity of his entire family. قال ألم أقل لكم إني أعلم غيب السماوات والأرض قال ألم أقل لكم إني أعلم غيب السماوات والأرض وأعلم ما تبدون وما كنتم تكتمون وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ أَبَى وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةَ وَكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ وَلَا تَقْرَبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ فَأَزَلَّهُمَا الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا مِمَّا كَانَا فِيهِ وَقُلْنَا اهْبِطُوا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٌّ وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌّ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حِينٍ فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إنه هو التواب الرحيم قل نهبطوا منها جميعا فإما يأتينكم مني هدى فمن تبع هداي فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون والذين كفروا وكذبوا بآياتنا أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون يا بني إسرائيل اذكروا نعمتي التي أنعمت عليكم وأوفوا بعهدي في بعهدكم وإياي فارهبون وآمنوا بما أنزلت مصدقا لما معكم ولا تكونوا أول كافر به ولا تشتروا بآياتي ثمنا قليلا وإياي فاتقون ولا تلبسوا الحق بالباطل وتكتموا الحق وانتم تعلمون واقيموا الصلاه واتوا الزكاه واركعوا مع الراكعين اتامرون الناس بالبر وتنسون انفسكم وانتم تتلون الكتاب افلا تعقلون واستعينوا بالصبر والصلاه وانها لكبيره الا على الخاشعين الذين يظنون انهم ملاقو ربهم وانهم اليه راجعون يا بني اسرائيل اذكروا نعمتي التي انعمت عليكم واني فضلتكم على العالمين واتقوا يوما لا تجزي نفس عن نفس شيئا ولا يقبل منها شفاعة ولا يؤخذ منها عدل ولا هم ينصرون 
وإذ نجيناكم من آل فرعون يسومونكم سوء العذاب يذبحون أبناءكم ويستحيون نساء Everything has a foundation. Just like this building. Under the ground, you can see its foundation, holding it up, keeping it strong. Or this tree. A tree's foundations are its roots. They keep it secure in the ground and help it to grow. And that's what a foundation does. It's the base of something. Keeping it firm and secure, making it strong. Islam's foundations are five pillars. The first of these five pillars, and the most important of them, is belief. Belief in one God. That's it. One. The God of the universe and all of mankind. A God that has no partners. The name of God in Arabic is Allah, the most gracious, most merciful. After believing in one God, you then believe in the prophets of God. From the very first man on earth, the very first prophet, Adam, through the many prophets that have come between, from Noah, to Moses, to Jesus, right down to the final prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. This has been the first foundation, to believe in and to testify that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his final prophet and messenger. And so, once you have this core belief, everything else falls into place. Get it? Good. The second pillar is Salah, or prayer, to pray to God. After all, if you've believed in God, it's only natural that you should worship Him. And you should only worship Him in the way He has prescribed. This is why a Muslim stands five times a day for prayer, to remember God throughout the day. The soul needs to be fed, just as the body does. And when we often find ourselves searching for contentment in material things, nothing is more nourishing, more satisfying, or makes one more content than prayer. And here's the third pillar of Islam. Zakah. Zakah can be described as charity, but it's a specific kind of charity. Its purpose is to purify one's wealth. Here's how it works. This fridge is your bank account, and after using the money you needed, you take what you've saved, be it £1,000 or just £100, and after one year of having this amount saved, you take only 2.5% of it and give it in charity. So, 2.5% of £1,000 would be only £25, or 2.5% of £100 would be a mere £2.50. Give it to a cause you prefer, such as the poor and needy, disaster victims, or even a local charity such as helping the homeless. There is always the voluntary charity, the TV's social media sites are the best way to contact us from anywhere around the world. Stay connected with Huda TV's latest news and programs through Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Skype, and Instagram. It's fast and easy. Stay up to date with your favorite shows and scholars today. Huda TV, a light in every home. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers everywhere, welcome back. We do apologize for this unintended drawback. Something happened. There was like a major blackout in the entire media city. All the channels uh, all of a sudden were blacked. So uh, alhamdulillah wa shukrullah, we're back. Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. I guess we are on a generator now, but we're back and we're live with you, brothers and sisters. I hope you're still uh, tuning in. 
Brother Hamid from the KSA asked the very first question about his wife wanted to uh, invest some money in a continuous charity. So he's asking about a particular project which is in building a masjid. Would that be considered as a continuous charity? Yes, it will be considered a continuous charity. The word charity, everybody knows what it means. And uh, the charitable causes are beyond count, whether distributing Quran, feeding the poor, building masajid, helping orphans, sponsoring widows, and all of that. But what is considered jariyah or continuous? This is what the Prophet ﷺ said when he said that whenever the person dies, all his deeds will come to end except from three ways. And he mentioned one of the three ways, the continuous charity. A charity which its virtues are continuous. Benefit is continuous. For instance, when you build a masjid, or you participate in building a masjid, so long as people are praying in this masjid, you get a similar word of those who pray in this masjid. When you uh, dig a water well, as long as people are drinking from this water well, if it lasts for 10 years, 10 year, uh, 20 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, alhamdulillah, shukullah, you are getting a continuous reward from this project. So what differentiates between a regular charity and a continuous charity is that the charity, its virtues will be continuous. Okay? You can apply that to building a school, an orphanage, distributing printing and distributing Qur'ans, da'wah materials. We considered the project that we're working in right now a continuous charity. Alhamdulillah wa shukullah, I see people watching the, the recorded programs on YouTube and other media means and benefiting out of that years later. As long as, alhamdulillah, people are benefiting out of that, that's a con continuous charity for people who invested in that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad from Chad. Alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, how are you? Fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for calling back, Muhammad. Go ahead. Okay, I want to ask you the one question. Muhammad, do me a favor and mute your okay, TV, please. One question. Muhammad, do me a favor and mute your TV. Some people who they are learning English is a church. That why halal or haram? I got your question. Thank you. Okay, Muhammad is asking about whether learning English is halal or haram. Learning any language is definitely halal. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of learning this language? Because now it's not only about halal and haram, also it's about investing time and effort, mental effort, uh, financial um, you know, uh, need, means in order to learn a language. So the purpose will actually turn the mere halal into an act of worship. I'm learning this language in order to benefit my people or benefit those people, to talk to them, to learn a particular science or field of science that they know it, I do not know it, I can transmit it to my people, you know. By learning any language, of course, is permissible, including English language, of course. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rachel from Jordan. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Rachel. Go ahead. I hear you. Go ahead. How are you, Shaykh? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. So can I ask, because before, I'm married in Christian, but we broke now for three years. And I converted Sister Rachel, there is, year. Sister Rachel, if there I is, again, there is a long do? delay. It seems like you're calling from a Skype or a phone card. So if you can just present your question all at once, I will appreciate that. Okay. Because before, Shred, I married in Christian, but now I'm converted in Islam. If I want to marry again, what should I do? Okay, so you're not married currently. What should I do? 
I married before in Christian, but we broke now. Now you're not married, okay. If you, alhamdulillah, have accepted Islam and you want to marry, what you need okay. to do is make sure that you have a guardian. If you don't have any family member, male family member, who is a Muslim, if you don't have your father, your brother, you know, your uncle is a Muslim, then simply go to the nearest masjid, okay? And as the imam that you want to get married and you're looking for a guardian to represent you. And this person, if he accepts to be your guardian or if in Jordan a judge will be your guardian, then simply he will carry on the process of giving you in marriage. If you have already somebody in mind, if a Muslim wants to marry you, that you would need a guardian and you would need two male witnesses. They must be just witnesses. And of course, you will accept the dowry from your husband. Once he presents to you an offer and you accept, and obviously it will be your guardian who would do the contract on your behalf, then you can simply marry this person. And this is how you perform the marriage and the marriage process in Islam. Barakallahu fiki, Sister Rachel from Jordan. Um, before the blackout, I was answering Sister Sarah's question from Qatar that if the husband beats his wife on her face and he's abusive, can she defend herself? Of course, she can defend herself. Do you think Islam allows that in the first place? No. As a matter of fact, the Prophet ﷺ answered one of the Sahaba's question when he asked him, what are my wife's rights upon me? He said, amongst the rights, وَأَلَّا تَضْرِبَ الْوَجْهَ وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ وَأَلَّا تَهْجُرَ إِلَّا فِي الْبَيْتِ That you should never touch her face. You should never uh, uh, slap her on the face or uh, beat her on the face or be abusive or call her bad names. And when you desert her only in bed, not in public, people should not know about what is between you and her to that extent. And the Prophet وسلم, said that how could a person beat his wife like he's beating his slave? Then at night he wants her to sleep with him and share with him bed. That is not accepted. So you can defend yourself and uh, you can actually present your case if he is like that before a court so that he should stop abusing you. Again, Whenever I answer any question similar to that, I do not know the questioner himself or herself. So I'm answering the question in general. I say that whether I'm answering the question on Ask Oda, Islam Channel, Peace TV, Iqra, whatever, I, I don't know the questioner. So I don't want the other party to say, because I get some, you know, some replies like that. How could you say that you didn't hear from me? Absolutely, I'm not a judge here. You know, if I'm a judge, and if I'm saying that I separate you from your husband because he's abusive, you're so right. I'm not passing a judgment. I'm just giving a fatwa that is not permissible. I don't know the name of the husband, and I don't know whether this is real or not. But if the question is presented in writing, or verbal, orally, like that, what do you think of a person does this? No, the Prophet Sallallahu said this is not permissible. Okay? Barakallah fiqh. Sister Aisha uh, from Nigeria again is asking about a husband who drinks and he misses the prayer. What should the wife do? Okay, um, number one, the wife should really make her best to make plenty of dua for the husband that may Allah guide him, especially if the couple have children. It's easy to break, it's easy to separate but you should not expect me to begin by saying that you should divorce him or ask him to divorce you or go to a court in order to um, uh, seek fasqh separation of this marriage. No, I'm not going to say that. And same if the husband says that my wife is not wearing hijab and she doesn't pray or she doesn't pray on a regular basis, you know, I have to consume the proper means. Give her da'wah, give him da'wah, talk to them, uh, be patient, remind them that, you know, this whole life is about being dutiful to Allah. It's a test that we need to pass the test together. We want to enter paradise together, right? We want to be a couple in paradise together. I cannot accept that my husband will go to hell because he doesn't pray or because he drinks. 
and you remind him with the ahadith, what if the husband or whoever the other party is persistent and is stubborn and does not want to change in this condition? If you fear that your iman may decrease and that may influence badly your children, it is absolutely your right to seek separation and may Allah give you a better partner than this person, whether it's he or she. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, Brother Adam Ali, we had a, a large volume of callers, subhanAllah, before uh, um, the blackout. I guess that the viewers may have assumed that uh, went off air. So I hope, inshallah, we still have some people who are watching the program. Otherwise, you can watch it during the rerun, inshallah. And pray for people's safety and security because, of course, you know, the whole world, especially the Middle East, is going through turmoil. Bombing here and there, explosions here and there. It is not safe anymore. May Allah keep all Muslims safe and secure. Allahumma ameen. Brother Adam says, My family and I are expats in the, U in the United Arab Emirates. Usually we spend our Ramadan in the UAE, but this coming Ramadan we will be going back to our home country, Singapore, about five days before Eid. My question is, do I have to pay zakat al fitr in the UAE before I leave, or do I pay zakat al fitr in Singapore at the end of Ramadan, or do I pay in both places? No, you don't have to pay in both places, most definitely. So where should you pay zakat al fitr This is a very valid question. Many people, you know, do not realize that this is something that they have to learn before traveling here or there in order to find out. In fact, you pay zakat al-fitri at the place where you experience iftar and celebrated Eid. When the Prophet sallallahu said, أَغْنُوهُمْ عَنِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ فِي هَذَا الْيَوْمِ Meaning that make sure that the poor people are not in need. As their needs are, you know, uh, suffice for on the day, on the Eid day. So this is a place where you experience the end of Ramadan and celebrate Eid and pray Eid. Before Salatul Eid, your zakat should be paid. So, if you happen to pay zakatul fitr before traveling because of a fatwa that you may pay it a few days before the end of Ramadan, then you decided to travel. You're not required to pay zakatul fitr or duplicate it. Pay it one more time. But if you know that you will be traveling to a country to attend the Eid there a few days before the end of Ramadan, then you should pay zakat al-fitr in the country in which you are celebrating Eid. Barakallahu feek, Brother Adam. Very good question, mashaAllah. Um, Brother Abdul Jumia says in his question, can my father who is sick and never misses the prayers in congregation, but now due to sickness and old age, could not do that. Follow the Imam's prayer from the Masjid, which is just one block from our house here in Nigeria, uh, from his room or in the house. No, that is not permissible. There must be continuity and uh, continuity in the rows, and that the Imam and the the ma'moom either see the imam and hear him or see those who are praying behind the imam. So having you said uh, that one block away from the masjid, that is not permissible. Similarly, no one can pray at home behind the imam in the haram because he, see, he sees them on the screen. Barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Huzayna from Qatar, assalamu alaikum. Brother Hussein from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Hussein. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, this is going to be interesting. My wife just called earlier on. Her name is Sarah. She was leaning, uh, like, saying some allegation about the man. I was the one. Okay. I'm not to say it in public. Uh, you you <laughs> don't have to say so your name, though. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I mean, I'm not shy to say it in public because some of the people... Because our situation, our marriage is kind of like chaos right now. The problem is that my wife, she is not aware whenever she go out, especially she's from Malaysia, I'm from Nigeria. So whenever I go to her country, she's
it's okay, man, freely without everything is okay. Because why? I don't speak their language. So mm-hmm. now she's complaining to me that I'm talking to a lady. Why she is also there standing with me? But because of <laughs> due to her situation, like she cannot just stand me talking to people. So she will take it to something to a different angle. We we just can't. Uh, we like um, we're trying to practice a good Muslim, and we've been trying our best. We're getting close to Allah. Um, but the test is that whenever we say to people, we try to solve people's problems, but our own problems, we cannot solve our own problems. We always have chaos. And I vow that I can, I will not be able to use my hand to touch my wife. Mm. Yesterday, while we were coming from traveling, we went to get a SIM card. Just because of the person who is asking me, like, ah, who won? Who won the league? Who took the league in the, in the Qatar league? I said, oh, is this thing good for them? And that is it. I asked, she asked a question. I even told my wife, sit down with us so that the question at least, she can hear what we think. But my wife just wants to see, like wants to know what is going on. And mm. whenever the lady just has the question, I give the lady just straight answer without even smiling, without having any interaction. So this is what causes the problem. And on our way coming back, I was drive, driving and our baby is in the car and my wife started like talking. Ah, uh, if it's yours, you're not going to accept Brother it. Brother Hussain. Just not, like we keep talking. Mm. And I try to say, can you just, can you calm down, calm down? No. So the extent I use my hand to hit her on the back. So this is the reason. So at least I need an answer for that. And I need a counselor. If it's possible, you can call us after the show. I'll be very happy about that. Okay, Thank Brother Hussein, Jazakallah khairan. I will offer you something better, inshallah. I do counseling. I do marriage counseling. I'll be more than happy, inshallah, if you collect my number. But this is not for public. This is just for this case. Because you called in, and subhanallah, I, I made that disclaimer before you called, and I said, I'm just giving a general answer for this very reason. And this is really amazing that you called back uh, after she did, and you denied the allegations, as you said, that she said. Whether she is true or you, she's not, and whether you're true in your claim or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So one of two uh, choices. Either you go directly to Al Fanar Center, that is in Doha, and I have many colleagues who will be more than happy, inshallah, to assist you in this regard. There is Sheikh uh, Abdul Salam, and there are a couple of shiuch there, inshallah. They will be more than happy to assist you. Or if you wish, inshallah, after the program, uh, you can give me a call. Barakallahu fikum. And may Allah reconcile between you both. Jazakumullah wa khairan. Um, there's something, brothers and sisters, very important we have to understand. That subhanallah, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, خِبْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِصْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا That if you fear a breach will happen in the marriage life between a couple, then appoint an arbitrator from his side and another one from her family. And if they both intend reconciliation, Allah will make it easy for them to reconcile. The pronoun if of they, if they intend, if they want, if they like, if they are into reconciliation, may refer to the couple, the husband and wife, may refer to the arbitrators from both families, and may refer to the counselor, the arbitrators, and the couple. So what we need to understand that you can never, never look into a case like that by listening to one side story. But we differentiate between giving a fatwa, answering a question, and passing a judgment, or trying to reconcile, or declaring who's the winner, and who's at fault, who's right, and who's wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best. Of course, we did not learn these lessons easy. We went through some hard time. People try, trying to you know, influence your fatwa, put words on your mouth, then after word, you hear from the other party that, you know, you are not right because you did not hear me, you did not listen to my story. So, uh, it, 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 you know, we went through a lot before we were able to say this disclaimer. This is an answer to a question, a fatwa, not a judgment. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, here is a question before the end of the episode. Muhammad Nabil Khinjar. He says, Can we pray Isha between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m.? 
Let's not talk about the times, 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Rather, we recognize the Isha time as follows. It's beginning time when the red twilight is, uh, it disappears. Then, this is after Maghrib, when the red twilight disappears. Then its time is extended until the maximum midnight. There is a view that says the first one third of the night, according to hadith, which is agreed upon its authenticity and narrated by Umm al Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha. But due to the fact there is another sound hadith, which is narrated by Anas ibn Malik, that the Prophet sallallahu postponed Salat al Isha until midnight, which is the last and the latest time for Isha prayer. After that, it will be perceived, according to the vast majority of the Jews, as qada and makeup. Unless if the person had an excuse over a slip, if there was a necessity. Okay. So the idea that uh, you pray Isha before Fajr or Isha time is extended until Fajr is not recognized according to the vast majority of the fuqaha and according to the sound references. So when you say midnight, what does midnight mean? I don't go by 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Rather, I go by dividing the time between sunset and dawn by two. The outcome, you add it to from the time of sunset, that is midnight. I mean, if sunset is at 6 p.m. and Fajr is at 4 a.m., so how many hours in between? between 6 a.m. and 4 a.m. We're talking about 6 hours and 4 hours, 10 hours. 10 hours between Maghrib and Fajr, divided by 2, 5 hours. So 6 p.m. is sunset, plus 5 hours. So midnight is at 11 p.m. Midnight is the result of dividing the time between sunset and dawn. Okay, dividing it by two. Which means in some places it may be 11 p.m. In some other places it may be 10 p.m. Like if Fajr is at 3 a.m. in some countries. And in some places it may be 1 a.m. Sometimes whenever we used to perform Hajj during summer the time midnight will be at 1 a.m., okay? So it depends on the season and the length of the day and the length of the night. What time is Maghrib versus what time is Isha? So according to the vast majority of the fuqaha, the last time to offer Salatul Isha, which will be considered on time, is midnight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best. By that, brothers and sisters, we come to the end of today's program of Ask Uda. May Allah accept from all of us, forgive us our sins. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم. Until next episode, I leave you in the care of Allah. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test.